Hello and welcome to this video presentation on my management of a micro dog. This was an eight and a half month old Havanese bitch. Most micro dogs have a number of dental issues um, due to their size and development. These issues can occur in any size animal, but they're very common in micro dogs. And in this case, we had persistent primary teeth, impacted teeth, under erupted teeth, excess gingiva, and dental crowding all occurring in the same dog. Her problems were beautifully bilaterally symmetrical. I'm only going to show you the images, the photographs and radiographs, and the videos on the right side. Everything on the left side had been completed prior to me starting the right side. You can also visit my website, toothvet.ca, and um, view any of these papers that add extra detail to the subjects we're going to be discussing. So in this photograph, we can see the um, upper molars, both upper second molars are present, and in little dogs, they tend to be very close together, and that crowding leads to periodontal disease quite frequently. And then here, just behind the canine, we have an adult first premolar, a primary second premolar, and then a second and sorry, a third and fourth premolar crowded very close together, which is another issue that tends to uh, really increase the likelihood of periodontal disease between those third and fourth premolars. The radiograph again shows the adult first premolar, the second premolar, which is a primary tooth with its distal root resorbed, and then the serious crowding with the distal shoulder of the third premolar caught under the uh, mesial aspect of the fourth premolar and identification. The all three lower molars were present, but the third molar significantly under erupted. And uh, on the lingual aspect of the lower first molar, we have excess gingiva, a failure of the gingiva to die back properly as the adult teeth were erupting. And we can also see that the mesial aspect of that first molar is severely under erupted with the cemento enamel junction of that crown being well below the level of the bone and that really increases the risk for developing periodontal disease there. Further forward, we're seeing a primary canine tooth, no first adult premolar, no second adult premolar, and a persistent primary second premolar, and then the third and fourth premolars are present. And radiographically, we can see that the adult canine and the adult first premolar are present and uninterrupted, while the primary uh, canine and second premolar are still in place. And there's the rostral view again showing this is bilaterally symmetrical. Both lower canines are persistent primaries, and we're not seeing either of the adult canines. There they are radiographically. We can see that all the, the lower adult canines are present, malpositioned, and uninterrupted, giving real risk for the development of dentigerous cyst formation. So um, the camera is actually mounted on my glasses, so there's a little bit of, when I move my head, the camera moves, so there's a bit of movement. We're starting off with removal of the maxillary second molar. I almost always take this tooth out in little dogs because it, the way it's crowded against the back side of the first molar dramatically increases the risk for periodontal disease of both of them. And I find that if I get rid of that second molar at an early age, it gives us a much better prognosis for the much larger and more important first molar. Um, usually when removing a multi-rooted tooth, I will section it and take it out one root at a time, but I find very frequently that with these maxillary second molars in micro dogs, the roots are basically um, indistinguishable one from another, and trying to section them just increases the risk of fracturing them and leaving roots remnants behind. Also, they tend to be very tiny roots, and in a young dog like this, at eight and a half months of age, the bone is, is nice and soft and pliable, and so this tooth generally pops out pretty easily without the need for sectioning. I'm just uh, using a variety of different elevators to separate the gingival attachment uh, from the crown of the tooth and pry it away from the second or away from the first molar and um, there you can see it's it's up and out of the socket and uh, still attached to the gingiva a little bit so I'm going to reach over and grab some forceps and just lift it out. Now you know, I'm going to show you how short the roots of this adult second molar are in a micro dog. When I say micro dog, I mean anything under about five kilograms. But there are the distal and the palatal roots fused together to form one large root and then the mesial buccal root separate. And you can see they were only a couple of millimeters long. Now we're going to elevate the gingiva away from the persistent primary second premolar and the adult third premolar. We're going to remove both of those um going to section the teeth the second molar is pre, sorry the second premolar is an adult tooth with both of its roots intact we'll section through the frication 
being careful not to cause damage to the soft tissue, the gingiva, that we're going to need to close the wound postoperatively and sectioning through the primary tooth as well. Primary second femur, its distal root was gone, if you recall from the radiograph, so I just plucked the crown off. And now I'm sticking an elevator into the gap between the first, uh, between the roots of the third premolar and in between the third premolar and the fourth premolar and twisting the elevator to wedge between and shift, start splaying the roots apart, shift them away from each other and um, start loosening the tooth up. A little elevation around the mesial root of the second premolar here. Note how I'm guarding my hand. My fingertip is very close to the end of the elevator, so if I were to slip, my finger would stop me from going very far, and that way I'm not going to cause iatrogenic trauma to the patient. Those are loosening up nicely now. And I'm soon going to just grab them with a pair of forceps and rotate along the long axis. Twisting one way and then the other, loosening it up. This is another form of elevation. And while I'm twisting, I'm also pulling a little bit. And there we go. Out it comes. And I usually lay the root on my on my hand or on something to inspect it just to make sure I've got the entire length of the root. You will always confirm complete extraction with post-operative radiographs. So that will be coming up next once we get these teeth out. Got to be careful with this primary tooth. It's got such a thin, delicate root. The chance of fracturing it is quite great, but there we go. We got it all in one piece. And now we'll take our post-op radiograph. There's the distal maxilla showing that the uh, second molar is completely absent. That's an occlusal view. And then here we have the middle portion of the right maxilla showing that the primary second premolar and the adult third premolar are completely removed. And now we'll go on to close these wounds using a periosteal elevator. This is a Syslac EX7 periosteal elevator to elevate the gingiva distal to the uh, second molar, lift it up off the bone a bit and free it up a little bit so that I'll be able to advance it and suture the wound closed, get the gingiva closed tight around the back side of the first molar. And we're trying, that's the tooth we're trying to preserve. It's really important when closing intraoral wounds that there not be any tension on the suture line. So if you find that you're not able to lay your wound closed and have it stay closed, then the flap needs to be elevated more or undermined more or periosteal release. So here we are going after the premolar section. And again, I'm going to use a periosteal elevator first to get the gingiva and the mucosa and the periosteum up off the bone. And then we'll turn the periosteal elevator the other way around and use the sharp edge of it to incise the periosteum on the underside of that flap so that we've got more mobility. I'll be able to pull it across and close the wound. Just freeing up a little bit on the palatal side here so that I'll be able to get my suture and my needle up underneath that side. A little dab of gauze. Now we're using 5-0 monocryl on a P3 needle. That's a plastic surgery needle. It's a 3/8 inch cir or a 3/8 circle. Um, quite a fine needle. Very hard steel. Very sharp, so it doesn't tend to bend. We can get it through the, the tough gingival tissues without bending and breaking it. They're a bit more expensive, but they they last well through the procedure. So there's less wastage. Just using a cruciate suture here to close this wound. So basically in, in one side out the other, then back on itself, in one side out the other, and then tie it off. For the premolar region, I'll be using a forward interlocking pattern. 
See, we start with um, a knot at one end. Very important, the first suture needs to be placed to bring the gingiva nicely around the tooth that's staying behind. That fourth premolar, that's the, the keystone tooth here, the tooth we're trying to preserve. The reason we took out the third premolar was to improve the prognosis for the fourth premolar. So it's very important to get that gingiva sutured nicely around the mesial aspect of that fourth premolar. Now you notice I just cut off the tag end, but I left the suture line intact because this is a continuous pattern. I'm now going to uh, go through, take another bite about three or four millimeters away from the first. I like to go deep, so I'm going well past the gingiva into the oral mucosa and then getting a good healthy bite of the palatal mucosa. And then the suture line, the long end, actually loops through the last suture. So let's see if you watch here, I push the the needle through the loop, and that's what makes this the forward interlocking as opposed to just a simple uh, continuous pattern. I like this in the mouth because it's so much quicker to place than simple interrupted, and there's only a knot at either end of the suture line, so there's fewer knots to irritate the patient, fewer knots to trap food and fur and debris and um, increase the, the amount of odor in the mouth, um, and it works well. As long as your flap is relatively tension-free, then uh, a, a continuous pattern like the Ford interlocking does a good job of holding the wound closed. We must never rely on our sutures to pull the wound closed. If the, if the flap is not tension free, if you're using the stitches to pull the wound closed, the sutures will pull through the soft tissue and the wound will fail. So it's important to uh, make sure you've got tension free closure, but with this Ford interlocking, as I say, it's quick to place and uh, just a suture at either end. Now we're going to concentrate on the mandible. This lower third molar was it was way back there, partially erupted but under erupted, putting it at risk of developing pericoronitis. And one of the papers on my website discusses pericoronitis. Um, also, with the second maxillary molar gone, that lower third molar was useless, so that came out easily. One single simple rooted tooth. We've got a lot more going on here at the rostral mandible. As you recall, we've got a persistent primary canine a persistent primary second premolar, an unerupted canine, and an unerupted adult first premolar. And all of those are coming out. And because of the location of the canine tooth, I'm also going to have to remove the lower adult third incisor from the right side. And as I said, I've done exactly the same thing on the left side. This patient was bilaterally symmetrical. She had all the same pathology on both sides. So a periosteal elevator the EX7, using that to elevate the gingiva and the mucosa from the third incisor around to that persistent primary second premolar. Some of the procedures we're doing in this patient are to prevent dentigerous cyst formation, and there's a paper on the website talking specifically about dentigerous cysts, so I would recommend you review that. We're also uh, removing some teeth due to crowding issues. Failure to do that has a tendency to result in significant periodontal disease quite quickly in these little dogs. And that's covered in both the paper called Focus on Micro Dogs and the other paper entitled Proactive Dental Care. Now I've just sectioned the persistent primary tooth. There is the adult first premolar. It was unerupted and lying down within the jaw. It's um, In these young dogs, these teeth are, are quite easy to get out, generally speaking. As I said, the bone is soft and pliable. Periodontal ligaments aren't yet fully matured, so the teeth are not really firmly held in place. So they, they pop out rather quickly. I'll work on getting that persistent primary second premolar out. Keeping in mind, there is no such thing as a primary first premolar. The primary tooth behind the canine is a second premolar. So we're trying to avoid dentigerous cyst formation by removing unerupted teeth. We're trying to reduce the risk for periodontal disease by removing teeth that are involved in crowding situations. So the upper third premolar, the upper second molar. And um, we're also going to be working on some crown lengthening to reduce the risk of pericoronitis, which would then lead to periodontal disease. And we'll be seeing that when we get to the 
the molar further back in, in this mandible. This canine tooth, I was hopeful of getting it out in one piece. We'll see what happens. The incisor frees up pretty easily. Just elevating around the persistent primary canine. Trying to loosen it up. The radiograph showed that its root was fully intact, so I'm anticipating getting it out in one piece. I got the left side out in one piece, so you can probably guess where the punchline is on this one. Just trying to rotate it now. It's um, I'm able to rotate it through a fair arc, about 40 or 50 degrees rotation, and usually once I can rotate it that far, it's ready to pull out. And then there's always that moment when it teases you and makes you think that just a little bit more pressure and all will go according to plan. Let's get that incisor out of the way. It's blocking my access. So there's the incisor out in one piece. That's rotating pretty well. So tempting to just tug it. And there it is, except it broke. Son of a gun. So we will have to go back and get the rest of that root out later. I'm not going to worry about it now. I'm going to go after the canine tooth. The adult, the uninterrupted adult canine tooth. You can't even see it in the wound right now. We're going to have to remove some bone to get down to it. So that's probably a number four, possibly a number two round carbide burr in a um, surgical length burr. In the last few years, I've really found the surgical length burrs to be um, much nicer to work with than the standard length burrs. That extra length of the, the shank on that burr keeps the head further away from the, the head of the handpiece, further away from the patient, and it really allows me to see much better. So um, I'm pretty much exclusively using surgical length burrs these days. So there's the crown of the adult tooth. And... Um, I can start moving it at this point, but unfortunately the hole in the bone is not yet wide enough for me to get the root out, so I have to remove a little bit more bone. There's always the balance between removing enough bone to get the tooth out while trying to preserve as much bone as possible to maintain the strength of the jaw. Of course, once the tooth is out and the wound is closed, the hole in the bone is going to fill in with blood and we'll get new bone healing in there. So the jaw strength will be adequate and be quite fine once once she's healed. But we don't want to compromise it any more than necessary to get this tooth out. Just putting the instrument in sideways and then twisting it tends to get that tooth wiggling about. Just some small breed forceps. I don't want a great big long handled forcep that will give me too much power. I want, I'd want i much rather the forceps slide off the tooth than have it crush the tooth. There we go. That came out nicely. Now look at this piece of soft tissue around the, the base of the crown, the top of the root. That's part of what was the enamel organ, the aorta and inner enamel epithelia, which have atrophied to produce the uh, reduced enamel epithelium. And that's the tissue that surrounds the crown of an uninterrupted tooth and becomes the lining of a dentigerous cyst. So we got out much of that on the tooth when it came out, but more of it was removed as I was burring away the bone. And I'm going to go in with a curette later and make sure I get rid of the rest of the reduced enamel epithelium so that before I close this wound, uh, or when I close this wound, I'm not sealing that epithelium in and giving it a chance to form a cyst. There's the mesial root of the persistent primary second premolar. And we'll get the distal root out. You'll notice I change instruments frequently. We've got lots of different shapes and sizes of elevators. And um, depending on the size of the tooth, the size of the root, where we're elevating, and how much space there is between the root and the bone, all of these factors are going to dictate which is the correct instrument. But it's important to have 
a wide variety of elevators um, in order to uh, cope with all the various circumstances we're faced with when doing exodontia in dogs that can be anywhere from two pounds to 150 pounds. <clears throat> At this point, I thought I had all the teeth out, and so now I'm curating out the remainder of the reduced enamel epithelium that had surrounded the crown of that unerupted adult canine tooth. Now we're going to go ahead and get our what I thought was going to be the post-op x-ray, but you probably remember that um, there's something still in there waiting for me to get it out. It's just showing how the flap's going to come together nicely. But there's the x-ray. It shows that the first adult premolar, the canine, adult canine tooth, the persistent primary second premolar is gone, but the root of the persistent canine tooth was still there. So I'm going to remove a little bit more bone. This will be a, a number two round burr just to remove a little bit more bone so I can see the root better. Got to be able to see what you're doing, so getting proper access so you can visualize. And of course I'm wearing 2.5 magnification headlamp or surgical telescope um, and an LED headlamp and the uh, camera that I'm using is also magnified two and a half times. I've got on a, a number one half round burr and I'm just going to cut a little moat between the bone and the root of that persistent primary canine tooth. Create for myself a small space into which I can stick my elevator and elevate that persistent root away from the bone and deliver it from the socket. I think it's really important when you're working in the mouth that you not only have a head mounted light so you can't cast shadows, the light is when I'm wearing this, the light is in front of my head, it's mounted on my glasses so it's in front of my head, and no matter where I put my head, no matter where I look, the light is shining exactly where I need it to go. And then the magnification is also, I think, crucial to success when doing oral surgery. This is this is microsurgery frequently. So there's that root is now loose. I'll just grab it with some forceps. Oh, there we go. And there is the remainder of that persistent primary canine root. And let's radiograph confirm. Okay, so there's the lower third molar gone. First and second molar still in place. And there we have it. The canine, persistent canine, uh, the adult canine, persistent second premolar, and the adult premolar gone. Just showing right and left side by side. So those wounds are now ready for closure. I've already shown you how to do a Ford interlocking, so I've sped the video up here just to make it look a little uh, more comical, but also to get us through this quicker. So this is shown at, at four times um, actual speed. And just zip along, putting the needle through the loop each time. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to snug each knot down or each loop down before putting in the fifth loop. And then tie it off and then go back and suture the molar site. But we're not done with this mandible yet. This is just going to be one simple interrupted suture back here for the third molar. Again, that's it four times actual speed. Alright, we've got this excess gingiva on the lingual aspect of the first molar. And that would result in the production or development of a false pocket and that would trap food and debris and increase the risk of periodontal disease down the lingual aspect of that tooth. So that's, that's tissue that shouldn't be there. It should have died away when the tooth erupted. It failed to die away, so this falls under the heading of soft tissue impaction. And there's a paper on my website under developmental issues that discusses soft tissue impaction. 
Now I'm elevating the flap off the lingual, sorry, off the labial aspect of the uh, first molar and fourth premolar. Remember, the mesial aspect of that first molar was seriously under erupted, giving rise to concerns for pericoronitis, which could then lead to periodontal disease working its way down the length of that root. And that can, in, in a small dog particularly, can lead to um, pathological fracture of the mandible. So we're going to take out the fourth premolar. I've elevated the flap. Now I'm sectioning the fourth premolar. That elevation of the flap, that was conservative elevation, just so I could find the frication, section the tooth. We're going to get the tooth out. Then I'm going to elevate the flap some more. A lot of the literature shows you to, or suggests that you elevate the flap, a great big flap, early on. I, I like to leave the bone covered with the flap until I need to get at the bone. I prefer to not elevate a big flap at the beginning of the procedure and leave the bone exposed to more contamination and desiccation. The other thing you'll note is um, I haven't used a vertical releasing incision in this procedure yet and I virtually never do. I vastly uh, prefer envelope flaps. I virtually never use a vertical releasing incision. There's the mesial root of the fourth premolar out and then the distal root about ready to come out. There we go. Now I'm going to do what's known as a type 2 surgical crown lengthening procedure. I'm going to elevate that flap more and get more access to the bone. And I'm going to do this with a carbide burr on my high speed handpiece. There's risks to that. I don't want to cause damage to the mesial aspect of the adult first molar. That's the tooth we're trying to preserve. But what I want to do is shape the bone away. I can't raise the tooth. I'm going to lower the bone. I'm going to remove the bone in front of that molar and bring the crown of that molar, the mesial aspect of that crown, out in the open where it belongs. But I want to be very careful to not bounce that burr off the tooth and cause damage to it. So um, it's often recommended that this bone contouring be done with hand instruments, uh, particularly for starters, or for people new to this procedure, using an Oshbein bone chisel or a Riedelstadt bone chisel to cut away the excess bone and avoid the risk of bouncing the burr off the tooth and causing serious damage to the enamel or the cementum. Now this is a delicate procedure. It's another one of those things where we're, we want to remove enough bone to get the job done. I'm trying to bring all of the enamel covered crown of that tooth out in the open where it belongs, but I don't want to remove any more bone because part of the purpose of this is to event, prevent periodontal disease from getting down there and causing bone loss. Well, I don't want to cause too much bone loss. I'm trying to set this up so that we will maintain as much bone in that area as we can so that we maintain as much strength of the mandible throughout this dog's lifetime. So I removed some of the bone. Now I'm going to remove some of the uh, reduced enamel epithelium that was remaining down in this false pocket around the buried part of the tooth. So I want to expose the enamel. I want to expose a little bit of the root cementum and um, give exposure to the cementum at the top of the root for the gingiva to gain attachment to, to create a proper gingival collar, a proper periodontal seal around this tooth so that we uh, don't get periodontal disease working up that root and weakening the jaw. So it's a little bit of drilling, a little bit of curetting, back to a little bit more drilling until I'm satisfied that I've removed an appropriate amount of bone. Through much of the procedure, I was uh, just using my own left hand to hold things out of the way. Uh, frequently, when we get to the back of the mouth like this, I'll have an assistant glove up and hold the lips out of the way. You may also have noticed so far you've never, you've not seen me use a mouth gag, and I don't. I just, I have some mouth gags, but I, I don't use them. Um, and there's various reasons for that, but one is that they tend to overstretch the 
the jaws, they open the mouth too wide and put too much strain on the temporal mandibular joint. And um, they've also been associated use of, of mouth gags and opening the mouth too wide for too long has actually been associated with causing a, a transient blindness in uh, particularly in cats, but also in some dogs. And the thinking is that it's the ramus of the mandible coming forward as the mouth is pulled wide open. It puts pressure on some of the blood vessels and causes a, a disruption to the blood supply and causes a central cortical blindness. So we, uh, we do our retraction with hands. We don't hold the jaw open any more than we need to and for no longer than we need to. And if I need the lips held out of the way, then I'll, I'll have an assistant glove up and hold the lips out of the way for me. Okay, so I think we're at about this stage. Oh, just a little bit more curatage. So this seems like an awful lot of work to be doing in a dog so young, but with these little animals, um, their mouths are really just set up for disaster if we don't get in early and take care of these developmental issues. So I think it's very important that every dog, every cat, have a thorough oral evaluation at six months of age to make sure that they've developed properly, that there aren't any anatomic or developmental abnormalities. But particularly in these micro dogs, and I would say also in brachycephalics of any size, they're all going to be deformed by design and we can't make these mouths normal, but we can make the best of a bad design. And I think the sooner that's done, the better their future. So I really do think it's an important thing to get into these mouths at six, seven, or in this case, eight and a half months of age and um, take care of those issues. So here's the pre-op shot of that tooth. Notice how much of the crown of that tooth is below the level of the bone. And here's our pre-op view where we brought that crown out in the open and created a situation that is much more conducive to good periodontal health. And the sped up video of me suturing that wound closed. This will be another short line of forward interlocking. And then we'll get our, well, we've already got our post op rad, so that'll be the last thing to do other than a final rinse and inspection to make sure we're not leaving anything behind in the mouth. There's no tooth fragments. Um, tags of suture material, gauze squares, or anything else. We want to make sure that the mouth is free of any foreign material before we send the animal to recovery. So I'm just going to grab a, the air water syringe and um, do an inspection and a spray. Rinse away all the blood, check all the wounds, make sure that wounds are all closed. I haven't forgotten to close any. And that there's nothing in the mouth that doesn't belong there. Get things tidied up on the inside. And then I'll send the dog uh, to recovery or release it to my assistants to recover and, and they'll clean the outside. So <laughs> there are those references I referred to previously. Um, pericoronitis, proactive dental care, dentigerous cysts, focus on micro dogs, focus on soft tissue impaction. And just for fun, you might also want to have a look at this one under the miscellaneous topics section. Whole mouth extraction for everyone. I won't give away the punchline, but um, it's a good paper to, to have a look at. So I hope you found that instructive. Thank you very much for watching.